Association. I would particularly like to thank the Chief Justice for once again allowing us to use the court for this lecture, uh, which is being viewed remotely, of course, by a number of people as well. So welcome. Uh, Sir Morris Bars, as you know, was a um, considerable legal figure in our, uh, in our world. He was a Solicitor General and he also, very, at the very end of his career, practised at the private bar and brought some of his most important thoughts to the world of constitutional and public law in that um, latter part of his career. Um, he was really a great advocate and contributed in ways that are difficult to um, uh, overestimate. In honour of his memory and his contribution, the Association established the annual Sir Morris Bars Lecture in, two, in the year 2000 to be given by a distinguished jurist on an area of constitutional public law. Uh, I think some of the people who have distinguished people who have delivered that lecture in the past are here today, and thank you for coming. Um, this year we welcome Professor Anne Toomey to give the lecture. As you would know, Professor Toomey is Professor of Constitutional Law at the University of Sydney Law School, uh, where she is also the Director of Constitutional Reform Unit. Uh, I won't give you her CV, but I would like to say this about her. Um, she is an academic and an intellectual who speaks to the world of academia. She speaks very articulately to the legal profession and to the courts. She speaks to government uh, for and against, as you may um, appreciate if you read the newspapers. And she, also com and she also speaks to the community about the important questions involving the relationship between government and the community. Uh, in this respect, she's a very unusual person in our social and political world. And she's a very interesting thinker. And she contributes in a very considerable way, which is actually quite unusual and quite special. So I'd like to say how honoured I am to be welcoming her today. And the subject of her speech today, or her talk today, is about legal advice given by Morris Byers in the constitutional maelstrom of the Whitlam era. Now, examining uh, constitutional law and constitutional issues in the context of political and constitutional crises and getting to the bottom of the advices that are given throws a very acute light on our relationship with government. It's an important thing and she is a person who has and does marshal this material. Um, and I'm much honoured to be um, introducing her today to give this talk, so thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. And it is a great honour to be here today to give this lecture uh, in honour of Sir Maurice Byers. Sir Maurice Byers was Commonwealth Solicitor General from 1973 to 1983, a long time covering a number of different governments of different political persuasions. He took up his office in what were interesting times, and by that I mean it was both a blessing and a curse. Byers' legal opinions are now bound into three volumes that are held by the National Archives. They are themselves a lesson in how to write a legal opinion. They are predominantly short, clear and direct. But most importantly, they are helpful. Now, from personal experience in terms of advising um, government and instructing gov solicitors general, I have to say there are at least two types of solicitors general in the world. Uh, there are the types when if you ask them, is this constitutionally valid, and it's not, who will just say no. And then there are the other ones who will say no, but you can potentially achieve many of your aims, if not all of them, 
by going down this separate route, which is constitutionally valid. Now, Sir Morris Byers was of the second kind, the helpful kind. He was the kind that could find another way of achieving what government wanted to do, but in a constitutionally valid way. Uh, this was particularly notable in Sir Morris's later opinions um, as Solicitor General. He contributed significantly to policy development by steering governments away from unconstitutional courses of action and towards valid means of achieving the underlying aim. Sometimes his opinions in reviewing laws or proposed laws also suggested a better or more elegant way of achieving a desired outcome or even pointed out other problems that he wasn't asked about but he noticed in the course of reviewing bills. These types of positive contributions occurred when written advice was sought behind closed doors on a proposal that had not yet been made public. Byers was ordinarily unafraid of giving an unpopular answer. For example, he advised that there was nothing unconstitutional about a Queensland bill to create a treaties commission in 1974 despite the fact that no doubt the government really wanted him to find something unconstitutional about it. He also advised, more controversially, that certain key clauses of the Racial Discrimination Bill were constitutionally invalid because they were neither supported by the race power in section 5126 or the external affairs power in 5129. In this case, however, the government ignored his advice and went ahead with the bill in its existing form. Now, greater difficulty arose where there was a public crisis and the government was in a fix. This puts the Solicitor General in a very difficult position. On the one hand, the Solicitor General is serving the government of the day. On the other hand, he or she has an obligation to advise the government as to the correct legal position rather than simply rubber stamp the outcome that the government wants, its aspirational view of the law. And the Whitlam government was very aspirational in aspects of the law. Now, managing this potential conflict can be difficult. In litigation, for example, it's accepted that the Solicitor General acts as counsel upon the government's instructions. Even if the Solicitor General personally disagrees with the correctness of a position, he or she will argue the case as instructed as long as it's not legally unarguable. Byers, for example, successfully defended the validity of the provisions of the Racial Discrimination Act in the Kawata case, despite having previously advised that at least one of them was constitutionally invalid. Interestingly, Lionel Murphy, who was the Attorney General who had ignored Byers' opinion about the unconstitutionality of one of these provisions, was one of the judges on the Kawata case, and indeed, he was the fourth judgment that caused a majority in favour of the validity of the relevant provision. Interesting times. Uh, when it comes to providing legal opinions to government, the position can be more fraught especially in dealing with a crisis that's already in the public realm. There can be great pressure to produce an opinion that justifies government's conduct that has already occurred or is proposed to occur. That pressure is intensified if a joint opinion of the Solicitor General and the Attorney General is required, especially if the Attorney General is someone like Lionel Murphy with legal views that are coloured by political interests. Now, this was a problem not only for the Solicitor General to manage, but also for the government. During the rolling crises from 1973 to 1975, when the Solicitor General was not asked to advise, was often as significant as when he was. As we will see, this in itself led to a relationship of distrust between the Governor General and the Crown Law Officers. Now, the first volume of Byers' opinions, covering the period 1973 to 1976, was open for public access in 2011. Now, after being asked to give this lecture, I applied for access to the two other volumes covering the rest of Byers' period as Solicitor General. And I was pleasantly surprised uh, when they were actually given to me in a timely manner without redaction. I thought to myself, goodness, the Hocking litigation has actually done something good 
and cause the National Archives to change its general approach, which is one of maintaining confidentiality over anything that might have a smidgen of controversy in relation to it. I immediately arranged for someone to race off to the archives and copy and photograph the relevant um, opinions for me. Two weeks later, I was informed by the archives that someone had pushed the wrong button. Apparently, the files all remain secret. According to the archives, it is contrary to the public interest to release them because of, quote, ongoing sensitivities. Now to say, having actually read all the opinions that are now the subject of this level of secrecy, can't really see how this argument about ongoing sensitivities would satisfy this um, public interest test. Uh, the irony in this all is, is that the ongoing sensitivities are actually in volume one, the volume that has already been released and indeed was released at a time before the archives became paralysed by the pull of secrecy. Seems, however, to me on reading it that the reason governments don't want people to see these opinions is not what is normally claimed, and that is that somehow it will bind the government in litigation, but rather that it will reveal that the government sometimes is told that its actions are unconstitutional and then goes ahead and does it anyway. Seems to me that it's actually the embarrassment of behaving in a deceptive manner which is the real reason for retaining the secrecy of these volumes. But in any case, I propose today to talk about volume one because it does contain the more sensitive and interesting opinions. Now this brings me to Sir Morris's very first opinion as Solicitor General. It concerned the referendum bill on simultaneous elections. Now the bill had passed by an absolute majority of the House of Representatives, but was then on the 4th of December, 1973, referred by the Senate to a Senate committee. The government wanted to interpret that as failure to pass for the purposes of going through the process in section 128 of the constitution that would allow the House of Representatives to get a referendum to the people without the approval of the Senate. So the government sought Byers opinion. Byers, quite inconveniently, advised on the 13th of December 1973 that the bill had not failed to pass. Taking into account its complexity, its effect and its importance, he did not consider that the period for scrutiny by the Senate committee was unreasonably long. In his view, as it had not yet failed to pass, the procedure for putting it to a referendum against the Senate's wishes had not yet been triggered. The government, rejected his advice. And remember, this is his very first advice as Solicitor General, and it was ignored. Gough Whitlam, the Prime Minister, and the Attorney General, Lionel Murphy, then went to see the Governor General, Sir Paul Hasluck, on the 21st of March, 1974, and advised him that all the referendum bills met the requirements of section 128 of the Constitution. No mention was made of the fact that there was controversy about whether one of the bills actually did satisfy the Constitution or that the Solicitor General, upon reasonable grounds, thought that it did not. Hasluck was also provided with a written opinion. Unsurprisingly, it wasn't from Byers. It was a written opinion from Lionel Murphy that all four bills met the constitutional requirements. The referendums, as we know, failed, but if they had passed, there would have then been a real question about whether a constitutional referendum, which had been approved by the people, was actually valid. Now, we know um, that there are real issues about its validity because at the very same time that those referendums were put to the people in 1974, there was also a double dissolution election. The concept of failure to pass applies in both section 128 in relation to referendums and also in section 57 in relation to double dissolutions. One of the double dissolutions bills, the Petroleum and Minerals Authority Bill, known as the PMA Bill, 
gave rise to exactly the same issue about whether or not it had failed to pass. But when the Governor-General, Sir Paul Hasluck, was advised on the 10th of April 1974 to grant the double dissolution, attached were two separate legal opinions. One was a joint opinion by Byers and Murphy that a double dissolution could be granted with respect to more than one bill. That's a proposition with which the High Court later agreed, and there's nothing controversial about it. The other opinion, however, was from Murphy alone that each of the bills, including the PMA bill, satisfied the requirements of Section 57. Presumably, either buyers refused to give such an opinion or was not asked because of his first opinion as Solicitor General, which showed that he would most likely not agree. Now, Hasluck, as Governor General, in granting the double dissolution, wrote uh, that he accepted the learned opinion of the Attorney General while not knowing that the learned Solicitor General took a different view. Hasluck also recorded that Whitlam personally went through each bill with him and stated that the record was clear that they would satisfy the terms of Section 57. Hasluck stated that he was primarily interested in the issue of failure to pass. So Hasluck personally flagged this with um, Whitlam uh, and he said that he wanted to ensure that the record would be such as, quote, to do us credit in the eyes of the constitutional critic and the historian. Well, it did not. So what's the relevance of all of this? Well, it takes us to Sir John Kerr's dissatisfaction with the legal advice that he received from the Crown Law Officers. After Kerr became Governor-General, one of the first legal um, issues that he faced was issuing the proclamation for the joint sitting of Parliament after that double dissolution election, at which he was advised to list the bills that were to be discussed by the joint sitting. Now, when Kerr, former Chief Justice of this court, looked at the details of the bills, he realised immediately that it was, quote, extremely doubtful indeed, unquote, that the PMA bill satisfied the conditions of Section 57. So he raised this question and he sought advice. Uh, he asked whether or not he could include this bill in the proclamation, given that it seemed unlikely that it satisfied Section 57. Kerr was then given a joint opinion from Murphy and Byers that he was bound by Sir Paul Hasluck's decision to list them as double dissolution bills and could not act contrary to that in issuing the proclamation. The opinion asserted that the Constitution does not permit the Governor-General by one act of state to contradict or examine the validity of another. Now, frankly, I just take that as a quite bizarre proposition. There's certainly been occasions before where, for example, a mistake has been discovered and the Governor-General has reversed or contradicted a previous position. One occasion was when he gave assent to a bill that had given, been given to him in mistake. Um, because it had the same name as another bill and um, was incorrectly given to him. Anyway, we'll come back to that particular proposition. It becomes relevant later. Uh, so the opinion in this particular case, however, um, does have all the hallmarks of a Murphy opinion, and that is it's just a mere statement that the Constitution does not permit this without actually providing the reasoning that gets you to that particular answer. Now, Kerr was highly dubious about all of this, but he says that he acted on this advice on the basis that if the law was passed by the um, joint sitting, then it could later be challenged in a court and the appropriate venue for deciding its constitutionality would indeed be the courts under the principle of separation of powers. While Kerr was unsurprised by Murphy's approach to the legal issues, he was surprised that the Solicitor General did not advise directly upon the question that he had asked, which was the question about whether the bill satisfied the terms of Section 57. He thought Byers was either ducking disagreement with Murphy or being muzzled uh, by not being asked to advise, and that this led him to doubt the advice that he was then from there on receiving from the Crown Law Officers. He took the view that he was not being given the full story. And he was right, he wasn't. 
He was also right about the PMA bill on two counts. First of all, he was right that it should be put to a joint sitting. Um, the High Court felt, held that in the case of Cormac and Cope. And second, that it did breach the terms of Section 57 of the Constitution and was invalid, which the High Court held in Victoria and the Commonwealth and Connor. By that time, Murphy had, of course, moved to the High Court bench, although at least on this one he didn't actually sit, and Byers was left to argue the validity of a law that he most likely thought was invalid. Byers, one assumes, must have felt some vindication in his loss in that case, um, as indeed did Kerr. Now, one of the hallmarks of the Whitlam period in government was, as we know, somewhat um, murky attempts to manipulate the numbers in the Senate. What's often forgotten is that this actually started with the Gare affair. Now, Vince Gare was a former Labor Premier of Queensland, later joined the DLP, became a senator, was the leader of the DLP, and just before these events happened, had been um, dispensed of by his own party. So he was quite disgruntled and was open to the idea of receiving some kind of government post. Now, the other thing to remember is at this stage, first of all, the numbers in the Senate, it was 10 seats um, for each state. Uh, so that meant half Senate elections were five seats only. Uh, and the numbers there meant that normally one side got three and the other side got two of those particular seats. The other thing to remember is that prior to the 1977 referendum, when there was a casual vacancy, the parliament of a state could fill that casual vacancy, but only until the next half Senate election, regardless of the term that the original senator was intended to um, fulfil. So that meant you could manipulate the numbers, and that's precisely what the Labor government wanted to do. So a half Senate election was about to occur in a month or so. So the idea here was that if they could get gear to resign in order to take up the ambassadorship to Ireland, that would give them six seats in Queensland, and that would mean Labor would win three of those seats out of the six, as opposed to if there were five seats, it would only win two out of the five. So it was an easy way of getting an extra seat at the next half Senate election. So that was the plan. The execution of it was not quite as good. So on the 13th of March, 1974, Murphy asked Gare if he would accept the, vote, the post of ambassador to Ireland. You might be wondering why Murphy did that. Well, it was because the Minister for Foreign Affairs was out of the country, which was necessary because the Minister for Foreign Affairs wasn't having a bar of this type of um, procedure. So in the absence of the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Gough Whitlam was the acting Minister of Foreign Affairs. So after Murphy um, raised this with Gare and Gare was um, accepted, Whitlam and Murphy then went off to see Hasluck, the Governor-General. Um, it was the meeting, indeed, at which they had convinced the Governor-General to approve of the uh, referendum bills. Now, Hasluck, fortunately, left written records of what happened in these meetings, which were in the archives, so we know. Now, Hasluck queried how Gare could be appointed as an ambassador while he was still a senator. Hasluck, of course, was a former member of parliament. He was well aware of section 44 of the constitution and offices of profit under the crown. Whitlam and Murphy then satisfied Hasluck that his action in signing the executive council minute merely involved the nomination of Gare as an ambassador as distinct from his appointment. So there would be no breach of section 44. Now, ambassadorial appointments, of course, cannot be made without the other country agreeing. So the Irish government was asked. It gave agreement to the uh, appointment on the 19th of March. Commonwealth was notified on the 20th of March. In the meantime, Gare continued to sit as a senator and to vote. On the 21st of March, the Executive Council approved another minute which provided for the setting of Gare's salary and other terms and conditions of employment and stated that his appointment commences on and from the date to be, 
to be determined by the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Now, that Executive Council minute was discussed in another private meeting between Hasluck, Whitlam and Murphy. And this is what Hasluck records of that meeting. He said, we had a discussion during which I raised again the question whether an appointment could be made while Senator Gare was still a member of the Senate, and if so, whether or not it would be valid. I also asked what would be the position of Senator Gare if he accepted another office under the Crown while still a senator. Was it necessary for him to resign first? Senator Murphy, Attorney General, spoke in a somewhat roundabout way, but he reassured me by saying that no appointment had yet been made. My approval was only approval of an intention to appoint, and the actual appointment would come later. Even the Executive Council minute, which we were about to consider shortly, was not an appointment, but the approval of certain steps to be taken towards making an appointment. Now, by the morning of 2nd of April, the news of Gare's proposed appointment had leaked out to general outrage about Senate manipulation. The Queensland Premier, Joe Bajoki peterson realised that if the Queensland Governor issued the writs for the impending half-Senate election, which had already been announced and the dates for it set, if he did this before Gare resigned, this would mean there were only five seats to fill and the attempt to manipulate the Senate would be defeated. Now, there was frantic scurrying in Queensland while they attempted to get all the, the documents together to be able to issue the writs on that particular day. Meantime, senators needed to distract Senator Gare so that he wouldn't go off to the um, president of the Senate and issue his resignation. Now, in those days, people tended to go on strike quite a lot. And in this particular occasion, it was the kitchen and bar staff of the parliament that was on strike. Vince Gare was a hungry man. He hadn't eaten all day. So what way should one continue to, one, to keep him away from the President of the Senate, lure him into the office of a Queensland senator who just so happened to have a very large bucket of Townsville prawns and a lot of beer? So this became the night of the long prawns, as it was later memorably described. So, during the course of the evening, prawns and beer were consumed. The division bells went off at 10pm. They needed to go out and vote. The senator took out Senator Gare. They voted in the chamber. Guess what the bill was that they were discussing and voting on? It was the PMA bill. Yes, the very bill that had not failed to pass the first time, according to Byers, was now there the second time and actually was voted on. In fact, Gear voted in favour of the um, PMA bill. The reason this was significant was it showed a number of things. One, that Gear believed he was still a senator and went into the chamber and voted. Two, he hadn't resigned yet because he was in there and voting. And three, nobody else in the chamber, Lionel Murphy included, seemed to think that he was a stranger and to throw him out. So everybody seemed to think at that stage that Senator Gare was still a senator. Meanwhile, back in Queensland, where they were frantically trying to get together the um, election writs, they finally got them signed by the governor. They wanted it all sealed and done, and they discovered that the state seal was locked in a safe, that the key to the safe was held by a public servant who had gone home and gone to bed. So in Queensland, some other public servant was racing across town, banging on the door to try and wake up the man and get the key to the safe so he could get the seal to seal the documents because so, they knew that this was going to be disputed and they wanted it all done. And it was done by 11pm on the 2nd of April without Gear having resigned. The following morning, Whitlam and Murphy discovered that they had been outplayed in Senate manipulation by Joe Bajelke peterson and a bucket of prawns. Humiliated and quite angry, they repaired to Whitlam's office, along with Byers, some other legal advisers, and Sir John Bunting. Now, here we have Sir John Bunting's record of the occasion to tell us what happened. So, Murphy then proposed that they 
quote, take the line, unquote, that a casual vacancy had occurred earlier when uh, Senator Gare had been appointed, um, either on the first occasion of the executive minute by the, um, by the Governor General on the 14th of March or on the 20th of March. This was because he held an office of profit under the Crown. Um, to add to that, they threw in section 45.3, which involves taking a fee or honorarium on the basis that he had agreed that in the future he would receive from money from the government. Uh, now, Bunting, in his description of what happened, then recorded, quote, the Solicitor General indicated his concurrence in what the Attorney General had said, unquote. Byers was then sent off to write an opinion to this effect. Murphy went off to write a letter by Vince Gare to the President to say, oh, by the way, I don't need to resign because I was already disqualified a few weeks ago. Now, Bunting recorded, and this is no doubt why he recorded all this, because he was concerned about it, he said that he was anxious that the Prime Minister in particular, and the Attorney General as well, should understand one of the implications of what was now being decided. This was that from the date of vacation of office, which I took to be probably 14 March, but at any rate not later than 21 March, Gare had continued to take his place in the Senate. This seemed to me a contempt of the Senate and to be contrary to law. But not only that, the Prime Minister and the Attorney General must be taken to have known. This will reflect on the Prime Minister and perhaps seriously. He then notes dryly, the Prime Minister noted the point and then ignored it. So neither the Prime Minister nor Murphy were deterred from taking this particular line. Now, if you read Hansard from there, and it's quite a lot of Hansard, it turned into rather a comedic farce. The protagonists couldn't even get their story straight at which particular occasion and which particular event caused the disqualification. Murphy said one thing, Whitlam said another, and then the Minister for Foreign Affairs, who was quite peeved about what he called a smart trick, then said, well, actually, according to the last Executive Council minute, he doesn't start until I say so, and I say that it didn't happen until after the writs were actually issued. So somewhat of um, disagreement amongst ministers. Now, um, Byer's opinion was duly tabled in the Senate. When Murphy was asked why he did not object to Gare voting, um, if he knew that Gare was disqualified, Murphy quite bizarrely said that it didn't matter and wouldn't have mattered except for the fact of the Queensland government issuing the writs. Apparently it was all Queensland fault um, that um, Gare was voting when disqualified. Murphy, when criticised, just pointed to Byer's opinion and said, well, he says um, uh, that Gare was disqualified, nothing to see here. He then moved a motion to have the matter referred to the Court of Disputed Returns, but the Senate then amended that motion to declare, under Section 47 of the Constitution, that Gare was still a Senator, as at 3 April. It then censured the government and called for its resignation. Byers then advised that there was a powerful argument that the House no longer held the power to decide under section 47 of the Constitution about the qualification or disqualification of a member of parliament. And the argument here is section 47 is one of those provisions that's predicated with until the parliament otherwise provides. Byers said, well, the parliament has otherwise provided by creating the court of disputed returns and as a consequence no longer held the power to determine these things itself. Uh, he also um, advised that the Queensland writ was unenforceable while a question as to whether or not a place has become vacant in the Senate is unresolved. You can imagine if that proposition was so, how things might have played out some time ago when there were dozens of circumstances in which writs, um, in which the disqualification of members of parliament was not resolved. Anyway, uh, he advised that um, proceedings could be taken in the High Court seeking a declaration that the writ was invalid. The Commonwealth then commenced such proceedings. The Senate used the Gare affair to justify blocking supply 
and then a double dissolution was called um, incorporating the PMA bill. Now, as for Bayer's opinion on the disqualification of GARE, it doesn't stack up. Bayer's argued that GARE held an office of profit under the Crown and was therefore disqualified from Parliament from the time of the first Executive Council minute on the 14th of March. Bayer's concluded, I think that the better view is that a person holds an office of profit notwithstanding that he has not either commenced his duties or received his salary or that the appointment is expressed to be operative from a future date. Byers also argued that Gare was disqualified under section 45.3 as he had agreed to take a fee for services rendered to the Commonwealth, even though he hadn't rendered any services and hadn't received any fee at that stage. Funnily enough, all governments since seem to have rejected Byers' opinion because it's distinctly inconvenient. Otherwise, it would have resulted in the instantaneous disqualification of members of parliament who have in the past agreed to take up rather lucrative postings, some of them um, ambassadorial and other sorts of postings, but have stayed on in parliament until there was a more convenient time at which to resign. So just to give one example, uh, the former Attorney General, Senator Brandis, um, after months of speculation, confirmed that he was going to be the UK High Commissioner on the 20th of December 2017, but did not resign from the Senate until 7th of February 2018, the following year, and continued to vote on bills in the meantime. Now, he clearly didn't adopt Byer's view. No doubt he would have argued, and it is a reasonable argument, that there is a difference between agreeing to take up an office in the future and actually holding the office for the purposes of section 44. On the other hand, one could say that there are actually good policy grounds um, for taking buyers wider approach. As one of the reasons behind the provision about office of profit under the Crown is actually to prevent these officers being hung in front of the noses of MPs, particularly independents, in order to influence their votes in parliament. Now, another controversial issue that arose in Bayer's time was the dismissal of ministers. And this played out in two stages. First, there was the dismissal of individual ministers, being Clyde Cameron and Jim Cairns, and later, the dismissal of Whitlam himself, which automatically entailed the dismissal of all his ministers. And the two are quite interestingly related. In May 1975, Whitlam decided to demote Clyde Cameron, who was Minister for Labor and Immigration. Cameron's policies had resulted in increased wage claims, which had fueled inflation, leading to economic problems. Now, Whitlam asked for Cameron's resignation with a view to appointing him to a less senior ministerial position, but Cameron refused. Cameron, in a letter to Whitlam, which was conveyed to Kerr at the swearing-in ceremony, insisted that the Governor-General's power to dismiss ministers was a prerogative power that could only be exercised for good cause. He claimed that he was entitled to be heard by the Governor-General and that the rules of natural justice applied. He regarded the issue as justiciable and said that the High Court would overturn any action that Kerr took if he did not give Cameron natural justice. Now, Whitlam then advised the Governor-General to dismiss C Cameron without giving him the opportunity to be heard and said that such action was non-justiciable. Kerr later told Sir Martin Charteris, and we've seen this recently in the Palace Letters, that Whitlam's advice was, quote, supported by appropriate legal and constitutional opinion. But whose opinion? In the handwritten notes, and I have to say Kerr's handwriting is so dreadful, they're very, very hard to read, but in the archives, in Kerr's handwritten notes, it appears that the advice actually came from Clary Harders, who was the Secretary of the Attorney General's Department, and that he, that's Kerr, then rang the Attorney General, who by that stage was Kep Enderby, who gave the same advice. 
Now, while it wasn't clear whether anyone had actually researched the precedents, and it seems not because Kerr was actually told this was the first time this had ever happened. In fact, it wasn't the first time it had happened. Ministers had been dismissed before. One interesting precedent occurred in 1918. On that occasion, again, the minister says, you cannot sack me unless you give me an opportunity to put my case. The Governor-General was sufficiently concerned about that to instead call a full meeting of the Executive Council, all ministers, to come to a meeting at Government House, including the minister concerned, allowing the minister concerned to say their piece, and then getting a vote of the full Executive Council as to whether or not the minister should be dismissed, which indeed he was. Uh, the other example occurred in 1931, when the issue um, arose, and in this case, the Attorney General advised and said, well, actually, this is not a matter for the Executive Council. This is a prerogative that belongs to the Governor General alone, and the Governor General should um, exercise it. Uh, he advised that such decisions were non-justiciable and that um, no um, procedural justice was required. And we know now, again, from a decision from New South Wales, the New South Wales Court of Appeal and Stewart and Ronalds that that court did hold that such an issue is non-justiciable and that procedural fairness is not required. Now, back in 1975, Kerr told Charteris that he accepted this advice and considered it was his duty to dismiss Cameron without hearing him. Charteris replied that he did not believe that Queen had ever faced such a situation but that he had no doubt that the course Kerr took in acting on the Prime Minister's advice and refusing to receive Cameron to hear his arguments is the same that would have been followed by British sovereigns in the modern era. Kerr went through the same exercise with the dismissal of Jim Cairns not long afterwards, who again demanded natural justice and again was not given it. Dismissal was immediate, no opportunity was given to um, put a view or to seek another alternative course. Now, this is of interest for two reasons. First, in such a significant matter, Byers does not seem to have been asked to advise. We don't know why. Uh, maybe he took a different view. Maybe there was just insufficient time to ask him or he was too busy on other things. We just don't have a record to tell us. Secondly, however, it set up the Whitlam dismissal in 1975. It was Whitlam himself who had impressed upon Kerr that his power was a prerogative one, that it could be exercised without giving the dismissed person any opportunity to respond and to dispute it, and that the action would be non-justiciable. When it came to Whitlam's own dismissal under this power, Whitlam's advice that it was non-justiciable opened the way up for consulting judges which would not have been appropriate if indeed it had been a justiciable issue, and also supported the argument that there should be swift action without providing any opportunity for Whitlam to make his case or have the time to do so, or, more to the point, dispute the issue or consult with anyone else, like the Queen. Byers did, however, provide opinions in relation to the Governor-General and his or her powers. He provided two opinions about the Governor-General's instructions and letters patent, uh, one in September 1975 and another in November 1983. <coughs> he also prepared what became the disputed draft opinion about the Governor-General's reserve powers in November 1975. Kep Enderby notoriously presented this opinion to the Governor-General on the 6th of November, crossing out Byers' signature on it, writing the word draft on it and saying that he had not carefully read it and it did not necessarily reflect his views. Now, this opinion has often been mischaracterised in writing about it by people saying that the Governor-General, that, that it said that the Governor-General did not have the power to dismiss Whitlam or that the reserve powers did not exist. Now, that's actually untrue. It recognised that such a power existed, but argued that Kerr did not have a duty to exercise it and was not compelled to do so in the circumstances. Now, that in itself is a perfectly reasonable view to take uh, and a view with which most people would agree. 
The Governor General had a discretion, not an obligation, to act, and how he exercised that discretion remains a subject of genuine and still heated debate. But that is ultimately a political issue rather than a question of law. The problem with relying on Solicitors General uh, to give these sorts of opinions on reserve powers is that their background is that of barristers who apply statutes and judicial precedents. The reserve powers aren't in statutes. They're generally not justiciable, um, unless you go to India or Malaysia where they litigate absolutely everything. So they are not the sorts of material that Solicitors General um, tend to deal with. Solicitors General rarely have strong backgrounds in history, politics and archival research. The best they can do in such circumstances is to rely on what's been written, normally in books. But because most evidence concerning the exercise of reserve powers is in archival documents that are kept confidential, usually for quite a long time, often well beyond 30 years, and sometimes things you have to fight for in a court or elsewhere, as we've seen recently with the palace letters, it means that the books aren't necessarily accurate and there is a significant lag between what actually happened and what we later know to have happened. Now, when Byers advised upon the reserve powers in 1975, he was relying on books and the books were old. He was relying on books by Evatt from 1936, Fawzi from 1941, and Fawzi was mainly concentrating on Canadian issues, and Jennings in dealing with the United Kingdom alone. As explains quite a lot about Byers' opinion, he spent a lot of the opinion arguing that the dismissal of governments was extremely rare, referring to the last UK case of it as 1783, because he discounted the 1834 one, uh, and then looking at those identified by Fawzi in Canada, but without addressing at all the far more recent examples that were completely on point about governments being removed for failing to achieve the passage of supply. These examples had happened in Australia in the 1940s and 1950s, but they weren't in the books because the books were too old. But they were certainly within living memory. We're talking 20 or 30 years earlier. If, you, if, if everybody in this room can remember political things that happened 20 or 30 years ago, then you would have thought that this kind of material would have been relevant and known. So in that period, um, their supply was blocked on numerous occasions in Victoria. Indeed, on at least nine occasions separate occasions, um, supply has been blocked in Victoria, forcing governments to an election. So let me just give you one example and see how similar this sounds to you to what happened in 1975. So this is from 1945, 30 years before. You had a Labor Party in the upper house which blocked supply to a Conservative government, the Dunstan government. On the 26th of September 1945, Dunstan then went to the governor and requested a dissolution. He wanted the dissolution to happen in November. This is in September. Supply was about to run out. The governor uh, was not happy with the notion of supply running out and either having to authorise illegal spending or to have public servants not being paid during that period. So the governor said he would grant a dissolution on the condition A, that it was much earlier, on the 3rd of October, and B, only if Dunstan first obtained a, a vote of supply to cover the period, quote, thus obviating the illegality of payments due to the public service or possibly the withholding of such payments during that period. So Dunstan went back to the House and the House again voted to refuse supply to the Dunstan government. It also resolved that it would only grant supply to another government if Dunstan resigned. Dunstan went back to the governor. He insisted upon a dissolution. The governor said he would not be a party to the illegal application of public monies 
and that he required Dunstan's resignation. Dunstan was effectively dismissed. He had absolutely no choice about it. He was told he was going and that was the end of it. But it was described in the press as resignation, which is why nobody remembers that it happened. The governor then commissioned a caretaker government, which did not have majority support in the lower house, to pass supply in the upper house and then advise an election, which occurred. The circumstances there are so close to 1975, it is astonishing that such matters were not raised um, before the Governor-General at the time. And there were numerous other precedents to call upon, where it was Labor blocking supply, where it was forcing a lower house to an election, where the Chief Justice was consulted, as was ordinary practice in those days, where the Governor refused to allow government to continue without supply, where there was a forced resignation slash dismissal and where there was a caretaker government which did not hold a majority in the lower house but advised an election. None of what happened in 1975 was actually new. But none of this was mentioned in Byers' draft opinion to Kerr. Instead, the impression was given that such happenings were virtually unimaginable. Now, perhaps Byers was just completely unaware of them. He was, after all, a New South Wales barrister. He may have had no memory of what had happened in Victoria. Alternatively, perhaps he just wasn't allowed to put it in the opinion because it was going to be a joint opinion with the Commonwealth Attorney General. Whatever the circumstances, it does seriously undermine the standing of the opinion. Kerr's concern that he wasn't being properly advised was a legitimate one. Moreover, buyers in the opinion stressed throughout that the Crown, in granting a dissolution, acts upon the advice of ministers from the party with a majority in the House of Representatives and that the only exception was this doubtful case of forced, resolution, forced dissolution. But that's clearly not true. Minority governments, of course, can advise a dissolution. So can a government that's been defeated on a vote of no confidence, having lost its majority. So too can a caretaker government advise a dissolution. The only difference is that the Governor-General in those circumstances is not obliged to accept that kind of advice because it's coming from ministers who aren't responsible. Now, even the use of precedents that um, buyers did include in the opinion was, shall we say, selective. He quoted from the Victorian governor, George Bowen, in 1877 about how a governor should not intervene in a dispute between the houses. Might have been more pertinent to point out, however, that Bowen was actually punished by the British government for acting on legal advice from the Attorney General to authorise supply when it had been rejected by the upper house. It was Bowen's failure to intervene that was criticised by the British government. Bowen was demoted and sent to Mauritius for his sins. Bowen's predecessor, Governor Darling, was actually recalled from Victoria for acting on advice to authorise spending without Legislative Council approval and for permitting the use of bank loans to prop up the government when it couldn't secure supply. Again, something rather reminiscent of 1975. Now, Byers also asserted that the rejection of money bills was intended to be dealt with by the deadlock provisions in section 57 of the Constitution, and that therefore no reserve power could be used to deal with the position until a double dissolution and a joint sitting, the entire section 57 process, had been completed. Now, this to me seems utterly implausible. The three-month delay, followed by an election, followed by passing or refusing to pass the bills again, followed by a joint sitting, would take somewhere between six and nine months. Would you seriously be doing that while you had no supply? Um, and this brings us... It would have created a long-term economic crisis, which would be quite similar to the crisis that Bowen presided over in 1877 in Victoria, when public servants and judges were dismissed because they had no money to pay for them, where courts were closed, 
where mortgages were called in, where forced sales of property occurred, where shopkeepers lost their businesses because they had no income from people um, interacting with them, and when there was a run on the banks. This is the sort of thing that can happen when supply is not provided and the government runs out of money. But again, none of this was advised to occur. On the actual day of the dismissal, buyers gave oral advice by, via Sir Clary Harders to Kerr that once the process of um, the exercise of the reserve powers had commenced by the dismissal of Whitlam, it could be completed and that Kerr did not have to change course because of the vote of no confidence in the House of Representatives. Now, had buyers been familiar with the Victorian precedents, he might have noted one um, from 1952. Supply there had been blocked by the upper house. The Conservative Premier was forced to resign. A new Premier was appointed. Supply was then passed by the upper house, but then the new government was defeated in the lower house. Okay, precisely what happened in 1975. There, however, the government, governor consulting not one Chief Justice, but two Chief Justices, so the Chief Justice of Victoria and the Chief Justice of the High Court, Sir Owen Dixon, then forced the resignation of the new Premier and reinstated the old one, but on the condition that an immediate election would be held. Now, it appears, again, Kerr wasn't advised of this precedent, but even if he had been, Byers and Murphy had previously advised Kerr, as I mentioned before, that he couldn't contradict one act of state by a later one. So perhaps they would have said you couldn't do it. In any case, I think Byers' advice to Kerr was right, that he could proceed with the dissolution, but for a slightly different reason. The convention has always been that a Prime Minister defeated in the lower house must either secure a dissolution or resign. In this case, Fraser was defeated in the House of Representatives, but he secured a dissolution. That was a perfectly legitimate outcome, followed a number of precedents. There was no breach of convention in granting that dissolution, although Kerr did have the option. He had a discretion. He could have reinstated Whitlam had he chosen to do so. That also would have been a legitimate approach. But the convention said simply, either you get a dissolution or you resign. But it was up to the Governor-General to decide. Now, after the dissolution of the Whitlam dismissal of the Whitlam government, Sir Maurice Byers continued to advise both the Fraser and the Hawke governments during less turbulent times. His advisers moved back to the more comfortable legal domain and seemed to have been more regularly complied with by the government. These opinions, i.e. the ones now being kept secret by the archives, deal with everything from quite contemporary problems, such as whether Commonwealth officers can be compelled to give evidence to a State Royal Commission, seen a bit of that lately, uh, to more eclectic things, like whether a bill that, uh, sorry, whether a law that banned the holding of unauthorised military drills would ban marching girls. There's also a fascinating pre Cole and Whitfield opinion about whether a goods and services tax would breach Section 92 of the Constitution, and another really interesting opinion on the legal basis for calling out the troops in the wake of the Hilton bombing um, in what became known as the Siege of Bowral. In conclusion, you'll be glad I got to a conclusion, uh, being a Solicitor General is one of the most demanding but no doubt rewarding of jobs. It mixes important legal issues with issues of policy and sometimes high political drama. Serving two masters, the government and the law, is a difficult task at the best of times. Sir Morris had to manage it, not in the best of times, but the worst of times. Some of his choices may be criticised, as indeed I have just done, and I don't think that Solicitors General are actually the best equipped people to deal with matters such as advising on reserve powers. And really, we do need alternatives for giving such advice. But I do think it remains correct to say that Sir Morris's opinions overall are masterful, insightful, and most importantly, helpful 
from a policy point of view. They are testimony to the high regard in which Sir Maurice continues to be held. And they should be released again by the National Archives, pressing the correct button so that all of us can have access to them. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much and kindly, Professor Toomey. I myself have heard a great deal today that I've not heard in the past, even though I can see from those present that we have in our numbers a number of people who were um, alive and very much present at, at the time of this uh, crisis. Um, and events seem even more hair-raising when placed in their immediate legal and constitutional context. In respect of Sir Morris Byers, uh, one thing that comes through is, particularly in the context where he was giving advices at the very limits of just disability, the remarkable calmness that he showed in giving advice and the extraordinary example where he gave advice approving a course of action that was directly the contrary that that had been planned and devised uh, a moment before uh, the reverse decision was taken. So thank you, um, Professor Toomey, uh, for an extraordinarily engaging um, talk tonight. Um, I'd like, there is a little bit of time, if anybody would like to ask Professor Toomey um, any questions, then there is time if any of you would like to do so. No, no takers? Well, thank you again. It was a really engaging talk, so thank you very much.